Great, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm delighted to uh, participate in this conference, and I appreciate the invitation and the chance to uh, uh, to talk about uh, to talk about these issues. Uh, I hope that, uh, given how thoroughly uh, Ben has covered so many definitional issues in the first session and, and in the keynotes, that uh, uh, I won't there won't be too much repetition. But there, there may be a little bit, just as I stick to, uh, to my script uh, to some extent here. Um, so my name is David Simon. I'm uh, the, uh, the director of the Genesec Studies Program at Yale, which then uh, founded uh, about 25 years ago. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the constructs of genocide, uh, the way in which, just really about the way in which we think about genocide. And my argument is basically that the way we think about this idea of genocide, let me back that out, keep the word idea out of it for a second. The way we think about genocide uh, influences what we do about genocide. And what I'd like to do is sort of trace that, that, that the way we think about it over, uh, over the decades to some extent through, uh, through some major phases. Uh, I thought perhaps uh, a shorter title might be Constructing Genocide, but that might ask someone if I was supposed to deconstruct genocide. <laughs> That's not my department at all. So uh, I'm a political scientist, by the way. Uh, so yeah, we, I, I, I run away when someone starts talking about deconstruction. Uh, I have a second um, uh, sort of uh, autobiographical note. My own uh, area of research aside from genocide generally, is, uh, is the Rwandan genocide. Uh, I'm not going to speak about Rwanda all that much as Rwanda. I'm happy to entertain questions about Rwanda particularly, perhaps as they pertain to some of the comparative cases. Um, Rwanda will make sort of a key, but really just cameo uh, appearance as a pivot uh, in, in my survey of uh, construction of genocide. Okay, so the outline of this is uh, three phases, really. Uh, the first is to address how uh, genocide started out as an idea. That's why I wanted to back out the word idea earlier. How it starts as an idea uh, and becomes defined as a, as a crime. Uh, and then in a second phase, how that notion of genocide as a crime evolves into one of genocide as a process. And the distinctions here are not, uh, these aren't continents apart. They're, they're sort of neighboring countries, uh, maybe even overlapping countries with a disputed border. Uh, but they, uh, they make a difference. And then finally, I, I'd like to sort of uh, think about what some of the, the issues that remain with a sort of uh, post-criminal, but uh, beyond the criminal sense of genocide, when you think about it that way, what issues remain and what value might come from bringing it back into the realm of, uh, of an idea. Okay, so let me uh, move on uh, briefly. The, uh, the history of an idea, it, it starts with, uh, with Raphael Lemkin, who's been mentioned a couple times, uh, a couple times here. Um, his idea adopted out. Uh, this actually comes from a, uh, a small archive maintained at Yale part because uh, Lemkin uh, taught and served as a researcher at Yale uh, shortly after the past of the Genocide Convention, where he, he tried to uh, uh, write the first comparative, first book on comparative genocide. It was never completed, I believe, uh, and published later in, in, in uh, fragments. Uh, for Lemkin, uh, Lemkin was motivated in part by hearing Churchill describe um, this is from Lemkin's diaries. He heard Churchill describe the, uh, the treatment of the Jews as uh, a crime without a name. So part of what Lemkin wanted to do was put a name on the crime, literally come up with the word. The word genocide is his own creation. Uh, extermination had been used. Uh, annihilation had been used. But Lemkin thought that what was going on to uh, the Jews of Europe and what had happened to the Armenians uh, in, uh, 
uh, Anatolia in, in 1915, he thought that it was something more than just mass murder. Uh, and this speaks to our, our keynote earlier to some extent. But what, what uh, Lemkin was most, I, I think, found most distressing or, or most problematic about, about the, the episodes was not just the loss of life. Granted, that was problematic to say the least. But that there was, there was a, a measure of social destruction, this is one of his phrases, that, that was occurring as well. The fact that what he viewed as that we saw as a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of the essential foundation of life of, of a national group. And that that involved the interference in not just the sort of physical existence of a group, but its political, social, cultural, economic, biological, religious, and ethical, or its moral existence, as well as the uh, process that involves sort of evidence of the destruction of all of those. So it's not just the people. It's not just the killing and the loss of life. It's the killing, it's the destruction of everything that that group, as a group, was creating, how they existed. It was, wasn't just the destruction of the the extermination of the Jews of Europe uh, and of uh, 40-some members of one of his family. But it was the, the elimination of Jewish culture and Jewish life in Europe that, uh, that was part of this crime that deserved, uh, uh, deserved a name. So it's the, you know, the way of life beyond life, simply life itself, uh, was something that, that if there was going to be a a word genocide, a word to describe this crime, you would have to address that function. Now, Lemkin was also a, a lawyer. So he was motivated by this idea, but it was also this idea that, that uh, something was going on here that's not beyond mass killing. But he was also, uh, he channeled that motivation, he channeled his efforts into uh, creating uh, defining a crime. And so the first part of, of the story is one about how the idea became a crime, not to have that idea, but the, how the genocide went from this idea of something that's going on to the crime of genocide. And it's primarily the uh, uh, through the process of creating a one of the very first things that the United Nations uh, succeeded in doing was passing the uh, Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So Lemkin, Lemkin himself may be the one who brings genocide initially into the legal sphere only, although that wasn't his long-term uh, vision for it. Uh, but, but he almost necessarily brought it there. He defined the, he defined the crime and then he led the effort through his own literally tireless and personal lobbying with the help of others, of course, that about the halls of the fledgling United Nations to uh, to bring about this uh, this convention, and uh, it's it's almost it's certainly a legal term. We've we've um, read or, or Ben is quoted from the Genocide Convention. Article one simply says the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed peace of war, is a crime. It doesn't get more declarative uh, than that. And, and, and speaking towards my point. Article 2 defines the, uh, the elements of, of genocide, which have been quoted a couple times already this afternoon, so I won't read it off. And then Article 3 de describes the acts, uh, committing genocide itself, conspiracy, uh, directing public incitement, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. So further elaboration uh, of, of what it means for genocide to be a crime. Um, there are 19 articles in the Genocide Convention, as it's, it's commonly called. Uh, the first three do the sort of real uh, the heavy lifting in terms of saying, hey, this is a crime. Uh, the next four, I guess, just sort of it's like maybe minor lifting, but uh, they expand. They talk about the punishment of the crime, what's necessary, who can uh, adjudicate this crime. And that's something that is necessary in a criminal code. That's this is sort of logistics of, of, of you know, what a crime is. You can't have a crime 
no sense defining a crime, uh, particularly an international one, if there's no jurisdiction or no process uh, for punishment. Article 8, uh, I'll, I'll come back to in just a second, uh, uh, but, um, well, yeah, let me just come back to that in a second. Because Article 9 talks about interpretation disputes. Uh, Article 10 talks about the languages of the convention itself. Most of the rest of the articles deal with how the convention itself it comes into being or falls out of being or becomes uh, fomented. Um, I, I, Article 8 is the one that stands out because it's the, the only one that doesn't talk about some crime in the conventional sense of a legal code. In other words, a, 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 a US legal code that, that defines murder doesn't talk about how you stop murder before it happens. Uh, the Genocide Convention is, is a little bit different in that it has Article 8, which reads, any contracting party may call upon the competent organs of the United Nations to take such action under the Charter of the United Nations as they consider appropriate for the prevention and suppression of acts uh, of genocide. Now, what I, I challenge my students when I, I teach a class on mass atrocity global politics is, what does that mean? Or I'll give them the whole convention and say, um, what is the duty to prevent? What is the specific duty to prevent? And it's not very clear there. We, a contracting party may call upon it. it makes it sound almost optional. Um, so that, that the author of the memo uh, that uh, uh, Z mentioned, that Z mentioned earlier, she was wrong, actually. It, it, it doesn't compel you to do anything. There's still, by the, by the text of the convention, uh, a uh, sort of a voluntary standpoint. What's more, the convention, you know, for all its other articles about punishment, provides no guidance or you know, what happens if a contracting party does not uh, uh, call upon the competent organs of the UN to take, uh, to take a, an action as suggested here. So there's no punishment for not exercising Article 8. Uh, it's sort of guidance. Uh, and, uh, and I think this sort of plays out in the way that, it, so on one hand, it's interesting that it's in there. Article 8 is what makes this the convention on the prevention and punishment of genocide instead of just the convention on punishment of genocide. Uh, and it's different, as I, as I suggested, from an ordinary legal code in that this prevention language is in there. But it's not given any teeth. And I think the, the, as a result, it tends essentially to be ignored for most of the, uh, of the rest of the, uh, um, not the rest, but for the next several decades, the rest of the Cold War, which breaks out roughly at the same time the genocide convention uh, becomes law. In fact, some of the initial debates between and, and uh, debates within the UN system between the Soviet Union and the US were over uh, whether or not this genocide convention could be used as a tool to discredit the other in uh, each other's uh, in sort of domestic affairs. Could it be used to score points in this new international forum that is the United Nations? There was a group led uh, by the uh, by the NAACP that produced a document in the U.S. called We Charge Genocide, arguing that the systematic lynching of black Americans in the American South, which is continuing uh, into the 40s, uh, that that constituted, that met the definition of genocide under Article 2. Uh, and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, among others, uh, tried to push Try to uh, uh, deflect that and, and uh, repress that uh, uh, that document. It never received any government hearing uh, within within the United States, and was sort of steered away from uh, uh, from other countries. In fact, the, the, the part of the story was trying to get France to so a, a, a lawyer in France to raise the issue, uh, and the U.S. denied visas to the activists who were going to bring this, uh, this case and, and had scheduled an event in France to, try to, to uh, try to advance that cause. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union, uh, there was 
persecution of all sorts of national minorities uh, in, in, uh, that could have been considered, it would certainly, uh, at least through an interpretation of a, of a document that really hadn't been interpreted, in, interpreted by lawyers around the world, much of what the Soviet Union, Soviet Union was doing in terms of uh, deportations and exiles and gulags uh, could meet some elements of the, of the Genocide Convention. But by the time, uh, uh, by the mid-50s, the decision was sort of, let's not use this for those domestic matters. Let's think of genocide, uh, the Genocide Convention let's, uh, as a, uh, a product of, of a post-World War II concern that reflects the, the concern over the Holocaust and an effort to make sure that the Holocaust uh, doesn't happen again. Uh, it's the, the genocide refers to what the Germans were doing uh, during World War II when we, the Americans, we, the Soviets, we other Europeans, uh, were trying to stop them. And that was a reasonable sort of uh, detente. Uh, and it meant that on these domestic matters, Article 8 was really not invoked through, uh, in any serious way, in any consequential way, uh, until the end of uh, the Cold War, uh, not, just in, um, uh, not just internally, but externally as well. Uh, so meanwhile, what, meanwhile, what that led, I think, in terms of thinking about genocide was uh, was really to add, uh, partially a debate, a debate inspired to some extent by those uh, the, the internal politics, political debates of the Soviet Union and the USA in the 1950s, to, to extend the debate about what should or should not be covered by the genocide. Should it include political groups? Would a better version uh, include uh, other classes of, of protection, economic groups? Uh, and in a way, what that means is that you, the genocide studies such as it was, was essentially a kind of legal exercise that happened over faculty lunches, uh, entertaining the idea of what, um, what might be tweaked, what might be the implications of the convention as it is written now, and, and you know, what would be a better way if we could do it all over again. Lemkin, for, uh, to come back to him, uh, after succeeding in helping to get the Genocide Convention passed, went back into academia, including at Yale, and then he started to write this uh, comparative volume on genocides uh, that would go back uh, into, uh, into the age of, you know, he went back to the age of antiquity, not quite as far back, he did go that far back, uh, and, uh, and draw numerous comparative cases he never finished it. He died in 1959. Um, and I would argue that for the next couple of decades, no one really picked up on that project. Genocide as, as an idea, as opposed to genocide as a crime, uh, would have to wait, uh, would have to wait a while. Uh, let's check my notes here, I'm sorry. Age is catching up to me. And I need bifocals. Uh, but the, uh, the, the other side, the, uh, the international side of the application, is there's a decision not to use it internally during the Cold War, through the Soviet or American citizens. That was met with a decision not to use it uh, uh, externally as well. So as a result, during the Cold War, there were mass murders that fairly clearly go back to Lemkin's idea, at least involve the effort to uh, exterminate, um, to eliminate a, uh, a social group of some sort uh, in at least Indonesia, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Guatemala, probably another half dozen uh, cases with smaller uh, uh, death totals that, uh, death totals that uh, that basically escaped the interest of the United Nations of the Security Council uh, because there was no precedent, uh, no willingness of any side to, to pick it up and, and, and say, you know, this genocide convention we passed is, uh, is something uh, with teeth. Uh, and so as a result, a lot of those cases 
uh, that I just mentioned went unexamined, um, honestly, until uh, until Ben and a few of his colleagues showed up in Cambodia in 1980, 1980 and, uh, and began to say, well, let's look at at least one of these cases. That's, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but on, on major platforms, uh, there really isn't in the 60s and 70s uh, much in the way of comparative genocide at all, and therefore much in the way of consideration. What's actually going on in a genocide, as opposed to, is this something that we can take to a court uh, and, and give a trial to? Uh, so the next phase, though, begins, I think, in the 80s, uh, with uh, uh, where there is a willingness to move beyond the, the crime construct of genocide and to start thinking about genocide as a process. I sort of two back of the envelope uh, inspirations for this uh, include uh, the, the a movement within social science to start looking at the correlates of war, the sort of idea that war can be studied scientifically. I'm sure you're all or more familiar than I am with uh, a lot of this work, uh, but the, uh, uh, the People on War Project by the ICRC is a non-governmental version. The correlates of war out of uh, the University of Maryland that, uh, that pioneered that uh, it suggests that you know, we can look at mass violence, large-scale violence, whether in the form of war or violence against civilians, which is actually less of a focus in but it's still there, it's still a correlate uh, it, that could be, could be studied. Greg Stanton, uh, who uh, also actually, actually happens to be a uh, uh, Yale Law graduate as well, so I realize there's a little bit of a theme uh, there, and uh, had worked with Ben in Cambodia in the 1980s briefly. Uh, he sort of took, I, what I would say, took the correlates of war uh, process and a sort of social science lens uh, to some extent to, uh, to try to develop a, a theory of, of genocide um, or of a paradigm of genocide, a new construct of genocide, recognizing that genocide is something of a process, uh, a, pol a political process that it has what he viewed as stages. Uh, so it's not just the execution of something identifiable in art that, that matches with Article 2 or 3 of the Convention, but rather uh, there are uh, anterior plans, there are precursors, uh, there are uh, stages that we can recognize as uh, uh, likely to lead to mass atrocities. And I think this broadly reflects uh, social science, the movement of social sciences into the study of conflict generally in, in new ways in the, in the 80s uh, and 90s, and history, I might add, as well. Maybe history was there longer. As a social scientist, I won't necessarily speak for them. But it also brings to, uh, I would argue, brings some life into the, uh, the prospect that genocide is something that can be prevented. Uh, in a way, we have the uh, resuscitation of Article 8 uh, of, of the Convention. Because when it's just a, when you're thinking of genocide as a crime, deciding whether or not to prosecute, the question is not really one of prevention. It's, it's an ex, ex post question. But prevention is ex ante. And if you're thinking about stages, uh, as, as Stanton and other social scientists, uh, uh, other social scientists did, then prevention becomes back into the uh, uh, comes back into play. And I, this is one point where I would say that, that Rwanda uh, plays a major role. Because Rwanda, what happened in Rwanda in 1994 was inarguably a, a crime, a violation of the uh, Genocide Convention of, of uh, 1948. There's just simply no way you could be at all familiar with the facts and debate that. Um, but what was debatable and what was obvious and what did haunt President Clinton and many others, and Kofi and I, uh, for years afterwards, is the fact that that it happened and they, the, the UN and the US, uh, did actually say, did nothing about it. Did less than nothing. Did worse than nothing. The UN didn't. I mean, there were there were troops. There were UN troops in, in Rwanda in 
April of 1994, the U.S. Uh, led an effort to push the U.N. to withdraw those troops from the uh, from Rwanda, the opposite of intervention, uh, running away from that uh, uh, from that conflict. And after the fact, it was clearly the wrong answer. So, but that therefore pushed onto the floor this question of, okay, so a genocide's happening. What are you supposed to do? What does Article 8 mean? What does Article 8 compel one to do? What are the processes by which, the legal and institutional processes by which Article 8 might matter, but also uh, what are the, the processes that we can identify in a country somewhere in the world that might lead us to say, hey, here's a, here's a case where if we act, perhaps we can prevent genocide. And that really didn't have a precedent uh, uh, before Rwanda and then Bosnia and Germany, so within a year after that. Uh, so that by 1999, when uh, it looks like we've got Bosnia 2.0, Serbia 2.0 in Kosovo, there is a, pre uh, a prevention plan, uh, a swing into action with much controversy and uh, uh, and whatnot that uh, that had not been was literally not things can be fathomable can be fathomed yeah, that something that wasn't fathomed just five years early with respect to Rwanda. Okay, so let me take a quick look now as we shift over to the ways in which genocide is thought of as a process. Let's take a look at sentence ten stages. Um, I'm just going to click them all up here because I don't need to dwell on any one of them in particular. Just to sort of show the way in which um, a, uh, a process, uh, or genocide is a process, yeah, is a process, what it looked like to at least one theorist. And I would say uh, certainly a very influential theorist. So, uh, a lot of uh, literature that I've read about genocides around the world, uh, particularly in the sort of consciousness raising uh, literature, maybe not as much academic literature, but. Uh, policy literature will make a reference to Stanton's uh, 10 stages and say that uh, you know we have to raise an alarm bell because we're at stage five or we're at, we are at stage seven in some uh, particular case. So what I'd like to do is think a little bit more uh, critically about the construct um, and highlight, I think, some of the strengths and weaknesses. Um, the strengths I think I've sort of emphasized already, which is that uh, viewing the, uh, the key strength is that moving from crime to process allows for some consideration of, uh, of prevention. If you think of it as a process, you can think of where you can intercede in the process and merely, rather than merely respond afterwards. Uh, in terms of the way it is set up, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, it, it doesn't just animate Article 8, it also animates Article 3, where conspiracy uh, to commit genocide, incitement to commit genocide, uh, are listed as crimes. And they are also listed uh, as or within some of the stages that Stan describes. Um, so uh, the, uh, the other advantage of this from a criminal prosecution standpoint is that uh, you recognize the process may, genocide as a process aids intervention, it also aids prosecution for seeing these other areas in which a crime might be, uh, be uh, committed short of mass killing, uh, as well as helping to recognize or create a theory uh, of, of intent, uh, or expanding on a theory of intent. If there is a pattern that should, you can show this pattern that these sets of, of actions of, of say um, dehumanization. <laughs> oh no! Okay. I went, sorry, I was trying to. I didn't know if I had a little red light. Here or not. I'm, not sure. I'm not going to worry about a little red light. Dehuman health point. Dehumanization, persecution. Uh, they are all parts of the. Uh, sorry, I'm scared. <laughs> So, and, and broadly speaking, as a matter of, of you know, academic matter, we can start to understand where genocides come from, uh, whether, we, or whether or not we want to understand that or prevention. 
That said, I think that there are some, um, uh, some weaknesses in the stage model, uh, one of which is that yeah, I think there's a sort of seat of the pants looking at the learning from the last genocide in nature to it, uh, which is to say that, if, that Ben was certainly familiar with, um, uh, with Cambodia, uh, but he wrote the stages, I believe, after his experience of working in the State Department and trying to set up a, a tribunal for Rwanda. And uh, my impression is that he's drawing primarily on sort of uh, the ex parallels between Rwanda and the Holocaust with some, uh, you know, some of his experiences from Cambodia as well, uh, and drawing it to, to create this model. The problem with that, I think, is that the, every genocide is different. You're all familiar with the the, the danger of fighting the last war when you declare war fighting plans. Uh, I think preventing the last genocide has a similar, uh, it, it's a similar construct. Uh, and so there's a little bit of that in play there. Oops, there we go. Uh, so if one has to recognize that every genocide is different. Some of these stages might not be there. They might not be followed successfully. Uh, and beyond that, there's not really actually that clear guideline for what one ought to do with an intervention. Uh, finally, it's hard to recognize, it's hard to say, uh, I think this is a sort of false implication for the stage theory, that there's a, a beginning when none of these stages are present, and an end when it's all happened. Although the, the addition of stage 10 denial sort of uh, suggests that it does, uh, it does carry on. But that, that's, uh, I'm gonna, as I'm going to say, I'll, I'll try to speed up a little bit here, uh, if we need some time. Uh, but there's also a, uh, uh, it, it's an issue for risk-based analysis as well. It's the, the, uh, another version, I think, of the process, uh, the process view. I think, so the risk-based is, is set up, uh, I primarily refer to the, uh, uh, to Barbara Harf's uh, theory that, uh, as he mentioned earlier, earlier, which was influential in creating the uh, framework of analysis for the for the UN, which was devised by the Office of the Special Advisor to the Secretary General for the Prevention of Genocide, uh, also known as OSCDG, uh, and it's been, since been combined with the Office for the Responsibility to Protect. Uh, again, there are in this case uh, 14 risk factors, uh, 10 of which pertain to uh, eight of which are said to pertain to all mass atrocities, uh, two more of which pertain specifically uh, to genocide. This approach, I think, is an improvement to some extent over the stage theory. It, it separates uh, notionally one item from the next. If these risks are there, there's, there's an explicit mention that they need not be, uh, they're not meant to be sequential. They all sort of carry equal weight. There's a, uh, a nice um, uh, division between them that, uh, uh, that there's both context and structure uh, involved in these agency and institutions that play into the risks of genocide. Uh, it, it, it's based on the fundamental premise that genocide does not form in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen, but it's, it, it's, it's planned, and not necessarily through steps, but through, uh, through this combination of context and, and structure. What's more, the, the, the factors themselves are fairly generic, but they are, uh, they also uh, are connected to a series of, of indicators, I think uh, 97 in total when they're all added up, that uh, it may be a little bit too much of this sort of UN approach to ordering the world, uh, but on the other hand, it does give one a little bit of guidance for what one might be, uh, uh, what one might be looking for here. Uh, the uh, weaknesses, however, still uh, still remain. Uh, and, uh, sometime, I do want to emphasize this as well, that the risk factors beyond stages sort of emphasize that there's a possibility for resilience beyond just prevention from the outside. But responding to risks internally, uh, I think, is it comes into, uh, into sharper focus as a possibility when the process is framed as, as this risks that combine structure and agency. As a matter of weaknesses, you know, 97 indi indicators, that should be stage, but uh, there is still something of an implication of sequence, even if the effort in the, the writing around it is to say that not necessarily. 
uh, sequential. With 97 indicators, though, I think there is a, a risk of, of false positives and the danger of crying wolf to say, well, you know, there's a high risk in cases X, Y, and Z and no genocide, so in case Q, um, if there's a risk, we shouldn't be all that, uh, all that alarmed. Um, there's a little less focus on agency when we add the, the context and something may be lost uh, there, particularly when it comes around to prosecution. Uh, if we all say it's context, if everything is institutions, uh, then the agents may, might not uh, matter as much. But I think the, the, the biggest problem may be, and this is a problem to both versions of, of the stage theory risk, risk analysis, or uh, risk factor analysis, is that something is lost uh, at the end, or something is not quite recovered in terms of Lemkin's original view of genocide as an idea. Uh, which is to say, and I think this is particularly uh, important as uh, um, looking at the back end of genocide. Because genocide, one of the things that I think that we as, as international activists, policymakers, and scholars are having a hard time with in terms of understanding and modeling genocide is in what happens when genocide is over or strictly speaking, how genocide never really ends. That the ideas of genocide, the goal of social uh, destruction in that Lemkin sense, tends to persist, whether it's expressed through denial, whether it's expressed through um, the maintenance of uh, internal displacement camps and the prevention of people returning to their homeland, uh, the the uh, struggles over repatriation, the maintenance of a culture of discrimination, uh, even in the sort of North American and the long array of, of North American policies towards uh, American Indians, one can say that the genocide that has happened has, in a sense, continued as long as it's not recognized in a certain way. It's not just a matter of denial but a matter of thinking of, of genocide as an idea is something that endures. So my, my call is for uh, to, 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 to recognize that genocide doesn't just end. To, to, I think to do that, we have to go back to that idea that genocide is an idea, that, that it's a very powerful idea possessed by its architects. And, uh, promulgated to its followers, and once it's promulgated, once it's out there, it's a it's a genie that's uh, particularly hard to get back into the bottle. And the risk of taking up even more time. I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. <laughs> talk about how far back can you take this. And so I thought to frame this, we would start with Cicero. Right? Because it's the unfortunate reality of the genocide intervention. And the question that no one room really wants to address is, if you want to stop the killing, you're going to have to kill some people to stop the killing. And so the question becomes, what is the role of force against force? So what I wanted to do today was take a look at talk about precision guided munitions a lot in the last 25 years, but what about precision guided words? And how do those words become munitions for policymakers? And words are really, really important. I'll give you this example. About 130 years ago, the Battle of Sedmet, Yatsik get killed one day on the way to the party, and he said, Yatsik, Yatsik, I hear that last week you met Ivan in the middle of a small field. He boxed your ears, he pulled your beard, and he spat on your boots. What do you have to say to this? Yatsik thought for a minute, and then he replied, I'm not so sure I would call it a small field. It was more like what? Or perhaps, this will work. Just a matter. <laughs> Words, how they are understood, how they're employed, are really, really important. Now you've heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. Today we're inundated with visual things everywhere. You have a cell phone. 
Okay, so just everybody has a visual box they carry around with them, unless you're paranoid like me or you have truck. All right, and you can swipe left. But if a picture is worth a thousand words to some people, I would argue that a picture is actually missing a thousand words. And when we want to say something really important, we write it down. What four words go with that picture? Will you marry me? Now, lots of words went to the left, lots of words went to the right, but in this case, the picture, the context, tells you what the words already were. And for those of you that have proposed a significant other, you know you wrote this down. You wrote the letter to the father, or at least you should have. Uh, and went through all those things that helped you get those words exactly perfectly right. Now, words, though, are the tool, it's the ultimate tool that distinguishes humans from animals. You know, E.O. Wilson, believe it or not, from the other side of Alabama, we don't like to mention that, especially this time of year, uh, but he pioneered the study of ants because he thought that by studying ants, he could learn more about human behavior. Ants communicate, they work in teams, they use tools, but they do not speak, they do not read, they do not write, and they don't do this. So defining the words that provide the cognitive context for human action is really vital. Words reflect, they represent ideas and things to be understood. We want to find the right word to describe a thing. And thus, language is full of neologisms. Newly coined words are expressions that have better capture an idea. Anyone who has ever tried to read German knows that Heidegger is the symptom and not an outlier. So we have words like this. Logia, the original Greek, or logos, which means a word or a thought. It can also, depending on context, mean words as they are spoken. If you're familiar with your Old Testament, all right, this is the Hebrew word for wisdom. It shows up 222 times. Okay, if you go and look at that, you'll see that every time it shows up, it's usually in a slightly different context, because the people who wrote that were trying to very precisely define exactly what the wisdom is. One of my favorite, Mondrosch, which is, you can tell by all the funny lines and hooks, uh, obviously a folks word, that stands for smartness or insight or wisdom. And because it wouldn't be an academic presentation without a German word, of course we have das Verstandische, okay, which means comprehension, but also can mean insight or grasp, appreciation, or even surprisingly for Germans, sympathy. So precision counts. And we have to be really, really precise in these words. And we've heard the three people who talked before me talk about precision and wrangling and arguing back and forth. All right, so what I wanted to do, again, to go back to antiquity, was this is from the Tao Te Ching. All right, I do not speak but like 15 words of Chinese, so I'm only doing some of the Chinese scholars here. Um, but this comes from the Tao Te Ching, and the, the gentleman, the commonly known as Confucius, says that the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their right name. Well, the problem is, what do you call something if it doesn't have it? All right, 100 years ago, the word genocide didn't exist. The concept of war crimes was always slowly starting to emerge. Now, if you've read your Barovia's use of war crimes here in Victoria, okay, even Augustine, they all saw a certain utility in war. And let us be clear, by war, they meant brutal war which the losing force saw them being either put to the sword or enslaved. Their women raped and killed, and their children also butchered or sold into slavery for re-education and conversion into a different culture. But as technology changed from trauma weapons to kinetic weapons and the way the fire and the radius of effect expanded, men had the ability to rhythmically increase the number of people they could kill in their time and space. The concepts of the word struggled to keep pace with this. That extermination was an idea and was an action to find a policy was nothing new. One only needed to look at the Old Testament, the concept of Hebron in the Old Testament, and the story of Saul, to see that we've been there before. Luckily, you've already heard great credits given to Lincoln, so I won't waste too much time there. Okay, but Raphael Lincoln and Herschel Octopod approached the scout for us. The story of these two men is extraordinary. If you have not yet read East West Street by Phil Sands, I suggest you do so straight away. Two schoolboys from Lviv, Lviv, but whichever way you want to pronounce it, they attended the same schools. In fact, in law school, they had they shared a professor on several years apart. They both escaped the calamity of World War II, and they developed two guiding pillars of legal thought with these new 
concepts. So Lumpkin, jumping over here left, into the word genocide, which focused on the killing of groups while the push Lotopak came up with the concept of crimes against humanity, which focused on the killing of individuals with less emphasis, although not while ignoring the group affiliation. Now, neither of them drew these words or concepts out of thin air. They were smart, well-educated men. They were informed by centuries of history of the human condition. So I think that when we use these words today, we should treat them with the almost sacred respect that they deserve. But this was not a new word like selfie or tweet storm, but very carefully constructed sets of ideas captured in four words. Genocide, crimes against humanity. Now, it's a popular misperception that words we commonly associate with mass killing come to us from World War II. In fact, as the means and modes of killing increased from the Napoleonic Wars to the Paris in 1870, and then on the court author and then the Publi and the Ravas and were done, the words struggled to keep pace with the technological concentration of firepower. But a few examples with which Lincoln and Roger Pop would have been familiar with in World War II include ethnic cleansing. Okay? Anyone here from the Deep South? Andrew Jackson. Okay, the war against the Creek Indians, the Seminole War, the invasion of Florida without writ from Washington, D.C. The Trail of Tears once he was president. Likewise, U.S. Indian policy in the West, especially after 1876. Reservations. Can someone here tell me the difference between a reservation and a conservation camp? All right, look at what we in the United States did in the American West, look at what the Brits did in South Africa. You start to see there are ideas and concepts that are out there that you have to look by the right name to call it. And just because the word didn't exist doesn't mean the crime wasn't committed. And when we take a look at that, we have to bring it up, it's been 74, but I'll say it in public. The Ottoman government, the Armenians of 1915. There's concentration, there's ethnic cleansing, there's mass killings of all people identified as members of a certain group. And had the word existed, it would have certainly been used by Henry Morgan without his desperate cable to back to Washington. So, what do you call then the extermination of millions of Jewish people during World War II? Well, some scholars believe that the word Holocaust is what captures this best because they took two Greek words that sort of matched them together, okay? And the idea is that you have a completely burnt sacrifice or a sacrifice burnt in it as an offering to a God. But if you read your Bible, you'll realize this etymology is solely lacking. The problem is, a sacrifice is meant to be willing. And although some Jewish leadership councils were forced to make horrible so-called choices about deportation and other matters, there was nothing, nothing willing in that process. And therefore, it cannot be properly considered as a sacrifice. As such, the term Holocaust no longer fits. I don't speak Hebrew either. I do speak so, so I'm not going to try to pronounce this. But the idea here is that uh, Hebrew is that a burnt offering is something that's entirely burnt, consumed by fire, whereas a sacrifice is purposely partially burnt upon the altar, and the rest of it is, is a shared meal amongst the faithful who draw near to God. This concept is mentioned 289 times in the Old Testament. So there's a race between wisdom and the sacrifice and offering, and the ancients are trying to lay out in a very, very clear and precise manner. And as if that were not all enough, at least two works in the inner war period mentioned the word Holocaust also in the context of the Armenian genocide. And there are references as early as 1142 to a Holocaust by French King Louis VII. The poet John Milton mentions Holocaust in Simon Agonistes in 1671. And that famous libertarian Karl Marx mentions the word Holocaust in 1856. So what are we to do? So show also not a perfect word. It means calamity. And this is what Jewish scholars believe most accurately, though not perfectly, portrays the totality of the extermination campaign directed against the Middle War, just like you heard mentioned a few minutes ago by Dr. Simon. Now, at the same time this was going on, on the other side of the equation, the Germans, as well as the Soviets, later the Maoists, later on the protagonists in the Balkans and Rwanda, they're also trying to precisely label things. And they label these things for three reasons. The first that they're 
trying to make sure that there's an emplacement of policy to delineate actions and organizational responsibilities across the agencies of the Third Reich in the case of Nazi Germany. The second was to ensure adherence to the rules and laws as written by the legal structures of the Third Reich. The Germans engaged in all kinds of linguistic leaps and verbal gymnastics to ensure practice matched the intent of the policy. And if you've never read the Einsatzgruppen reports, the last time I went through, I stopped at 25 different ways of saying bandits were in their arms. But the third objective of all this was, at the same time to precisely delineate things, was also to obscure and obfuscate them. It was, if you will, a policy to hide the policy. And if you've ever had a chance to visit Auschwitz, if you look very carefully, especially when you go in the summer, you'll note, if you were to look at it from the air, there are concentric rings of trees, barriers, and borders and boundaries. And why were those there? They were to obscure what was happening around the crematorium, because that was a special zone inside a special camp, inside a larger special zone. So these things actually can exist at the same time. Now, a few minutes ago, thankfully, you heard a great, exquisite description of the stages of genocide. You can see from his eloquent explanation you know, how important the words are to each stage, and how they attempt to provide a toolbox, if you will, for jurors and policymakers to call things by their right names. The naming of these stages is important. It's not merely an academic exercise, and it has significant policy implementation ramifications. So, at the risk of trailing on someone else's ground, let's use Rwanda as a case study in using the right words, okay? I, this is what I call dancing with the devil and G word. Now, we know from the internal documents of the Clinton administration, they knew the genocide was taking place. Allegedly, the direction of the president and the administration personnel were loath to use the so-called G-word. Instead, they made public reference to who was engaged in widespread and systemic killing. But they were quick to also note that the RPF, unlike government forces, did not appear to have committed Geneva Convention defined genocidal atrocities. Try saying that three times faster. Mm -hmm. Other phrases included genocidal acts. Yet again, on the 28th of April, this is roughly three weeks after it begins. All right, the poor spokesperson is up there and she's asked whether or not what is happening or what is a genocide. She responds, the use of the term genocide has a very precise legal meaning, although it's not strictly a legal determination. There are other factors there as well. We know, though, that by the time she made those comments, there was already a classified internal document in the State Department saying this is, in fact, a genocide. Two days later, not to be outdone, lest you think you can only blame the U.S. for this, the U.S. Security Council passes a resolution condemning the killing, but purposely omits the word genocide. On May 11th, this is one of my favorites, it sounds very British the way it's asked, Mike Curry is asked, has this government been able to determine whether any acts committed in Rwanda since April 6 constitute genocide? He answers, I don't know that they have made any legal determination on that. I'm not sure who the they was or the that, but you see how quickly he gets around it. A week later, the Security Council resolution says acts of genocide may have been committed. Mike McCurry, a few days later, once again, behind the podium, is asked, has the administration yet come to any decisions on whether it can be described? is genocide. And he answers, I will have to confess, I don't know the answer to that, but I will get back to you. I know it's under consideration. Certainly, though, things constituting acts of genocide have occurred. And finally, please pardon me for my bad French, but the piece of is false. On June 10th, the State Department briefing, now Mike McCurry goes away, poor Christine Shelley comes back out, and she's asked, well, just how many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? She responds, well, that's just a question I'm not in a position to answer. And a two-finger follow-up, well, is it true you have specific guidance not to use the word genocide in isolation, but always to preface it with these words, acts of? Let that sink in for a moment. Now, what we do know is that if you apply the analytical framework of Lincoln and Lutonac, these things enable us to call things by their right names. They place proactive policies, present options to senior leaders. They help us to recognize all of the things that tend to take place inside these along this spectrum, if you will. There's fewer words here than 97, but you see the idea. We're trying to boil it down to things that people can recognize 
that you can get from a policy maker to make a decision. These actions almost always take place in the wider context of the war. And while these words are important for scholars, the shadings of gray quickly evaporate the morning mist when the ideas and the policy must be committed and converted into hard nosed action. And so rather than spend, you know, till midnight uh, going through all the phases of that action, I just want to focus on two parts here and we'll get any questions and answers. Uh, the first is deterrence. Okay, we've got adaptive force packages, we have flexible turn options, we have all kinds of things. But they only work if the perpetrator leadership is convinced that they are going to be effective in disrupting their actions and their timelines. One of the most troubling nuances of this, though, is that the more credible the threat of an intervening force, the more likely the perpetrators are to accelerate the killing so as to present a fight for me before mass violence termination. Thus, the challenge is to keep the plan secret until everything's in place across all agencies, organizations, and lines of effort, so that at the time and place of an announcement of a possible intervention action, the time to commence with those operations is as fast as possible. This, however, degrades the potential efficacy of returns in the first place. So a more nuanced approach is to start planning or deploying diplomacy to include public diplomacy and strategic messaging making it visibly reinforced by both capability and intent. And by capability and intent, what we're really talking about is credibility. Who here has raised any teenagers yet? Okay, the rest of you have this to look forward to. But the teenager only reacts if they believe the threat is credible. Some of you look young enough to have recently been teenagers. Uh, but you know, when you say, if you do this, this is going to happen, whatever it takes, you would better back that up. Because otherwise you're going to back up the next red line, and the next red line, and then the next thing you know, you know they've wrecked the car at a drinking party. Uh, now that this has happened to me and my friends, uh, my children, but you know, I've heard stories about uh, how this goes. So you have to have credibility, right? And so this exists in the minds of the targeted audiences. And you heard a zine talk about the elites and the elites of the elites. Okay, usually we're talking about power elites and their substructures of later decision makers. They have to believe that the warning potential intervention force is both capable and willing to use force, deadly force, to stop killings, protect the innocents, project armed power, but also fight not only in self-defense, but as part of an organized active defense of those that are able to defend themselves. Admiring the problem does not solve the problem. And the one example you can use when we take a look at this is, if you take a look at the Rand Blade piece of commerce in 1994, take a look at the date of the Accords in 1995. Uh, I'm not a French scholar, but what I'm told is when you translate them back and forth, the words are almost exactly the same. The difference is, Rembrandt is backed up by a French aircraft carrier and French paratroopers. Dayton is backed up by U.S. Marines, multiple American aircraft carriers, the 82nd Airborne. In other words, there's a difference in credibility in what we might call a credibility gap. The words, the concepts, the ideas, okay, the maps, the ink plots, all very similar. The difference is in the credibility of the force. So the difference is not in the words, but the deployed force packages and the perceptions of the regional actors as to which their force, their commanders, and their national leaders represent a more credible threat. Now, I like to call the 1990s the decade of descriptions and definitions, or at least the attempts to do so. If you just run off the cumulative experiences the policymakers and commanders went through, from Kurdistan, Somalia, Sarajevo, Kosovo, East Timor, and others. These all created the shared experiences that led to the creation of the concept of responsibility to protect. And here again, the words and the concepts they portray are vital. And they must be understood by all parties as part of the shared understanding. Otherwise, all of these words and concepts end up as what I call the orphans of an action. So we talk about prevention and punishment. It goes back to the idea of credibility, political will, etc. Okay? To some, prevention is nothing more than benign post-colonialism. Punishment sounds like a punitive neo-colonialism. So when we look at Pillar 1, that responsibility of the state to protect its populations from mass atrocities, what word is missing from that? What word citizen is missing? Because as you heard the, uh, Azim talk about, if they had put the word citizen in there, then you strip people of their citizenship and poof, the problem no longer exists. 
If Pillar 2, the international community, has the responsibility to assist states in fulfilling this mandate. Well, this has the curious word of assist. If you live in the Congo, the Belgians come to assist you. That probably doesn't go over so well. If you live in Indonesia, the Japanese come to assist you. That probably doesn't go over so well either. This word carries colonial baggage in many places around the world. It erases the eyebrows of the Mount Line movement, providing a wedge of potential in human negotiations. What one nation may see as assistance, another may see as overt commercial. And finally, this leads us to Pillar 3, which is you know, chock full of nuts in terms of the words that we can play with. The international community must be prepared to take appropriate and decisive collective action in accordance with and in charge in order to protect populations. So let's take and tease each of those words out just for a brief moment. The international community, Laura from Henry Kissinger, can you tell me what the cell phone number and the email address is from that? All right? What this really means is six countries Australia, China, Russia, France, UK, US. Six countries who can actually deploy, employ, and sustain expeditionary operations in austere environments. Well, ironically enough, how many of those sit in P5? So you start to see where the well comes in very quickly. Must be prepared. What does that mean? Who puts the personnel, the policies, and the resources against these requirements? And none of these are free. Appropriate and decisive action. Go back to that example of raising teenagers. What's appropriate and decisive? I know it is my household. It's always decisive if we can discuss appropriate later. But I usually get some feedback, especially from my middle sons, on whether or not it's appropriate. Um, but at least when you look at that, you see the word action there, you think, okay, great, we've got an action where we can go with that. Well, the problem is, is that one organization thinks holding a press conference in Cairo is an action. Another organization thinks that a few Facebook messages telling bad people to stop that is an action. Somebody else thinks that flying a drone over there and taking pictures is an action. All the participants see these words as appropriate, decisive action, but they see them through their own lenses. National leaders on the global stage see them differently too. In accordance with the UN Charter, it pleads for the presence of a barrister at first. And finally, in order to protect populations. You haven't lived until you've had a true contributing nation command to say, hold that thought, Carl, let me call back to my capital and see if that's how they interpret that. And that's not the that actually happened to me personally. So it's important that we remember that one man's intervention is another man's invasion. At a certain point, though, the deliberations, while not concluded, have certainly culminated. It's time to have a fish cut bait. Deploy force or stand back and observe. But today there's a new problem with that. That's what I call the Libya effect. So if the 20th century draws the phrase never again, the Libya effect is, in the 21st century, never again will the United Nations Security Council Permanent Five authorize intervention. The Libya effect ensures that it will be even harder to obtain consensus for human sanction operations under the RTP movement in the future, and it unfortunately strengthens the orphans of inaction for our So the real challenge is this. We started with Cicero, and perhaps we should end up there as well 2,000 years later. And Cicero told us the legacy of the drama. The laws are silent in the presence of force. Timing is critical. Like, what I like to do is break this down into three decision spaces. All right, Because you're making a decision to go to war. It may not be Okinawa. It may not be stopped, but to the people who were there, it's every bit as bloody and as violent as any war that you've ever read about in history. And Tom Nichols isn't here today, but I'd like to publicly thank him for giving me some ideas to think about as I put this last bit here. So if we look at this, you know, I, I've lined the pillars up here. You know, pillar one you can think of as sort of being preventative, okay? Where you're trying to think, hey, this might happen at some point in the future. But even though we have increasingly complex and capable models, analytics, and tools, remember those 97 contributing factors? It's really hard to know exactly how those levels stack up. And the information domain, it's really hard to justify and prove that this is not so much an invasion as it is a protective intervention of the power of the pillars going to. If we move to the middle, okay, maybe we're starting to get a little bit hot for the building price, right? Okay, so now we're at preemptive. Here we think we know more what is about to happen. We're closer to the commencement or perhaps the acceleration of the genocide or mass killing. Preemptive in the era of large-scale wars with massive mobilizations, though, was easier. In 
the days of mass communications, it's harder than ever, although not impossible, you know, to look back in hindsight and see this was happening. We know that we talked about the documents that the uh, Clinton administration had telling them that we want is a tinderbox that can easily ignite. In 1998, at least one person in the Pentagon predicted to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs that the Serbs would attack Kosovo the following spring and that when an intervention force positioned itself, they would accelerate their killing. Um, another person in 2003 on the sitcom predicted that at some point the new Assad would commence a ruthless campaign that at least equal power and kill large numbers of people just to prove that he was at least as ruthless as his father. And yet, even with that, with preventative, it is still hard to convince leaders, commanders, and public opinion, the Holy Trinity, of the requirement to do this in the R2P, Pillar 2, or even Pillar 3 architecture. Which leads us to the act on the far right side here. This is the easiest to respond to, but at the highest risk of failure measured in state joint slaughter. Once a mass killing operation begins, especially in today's hypersensitive, hyperlinked information environment, it's pretty hard to hide that atrocities campaign. The best scenario might be East Timor, Sierra Leone's outpalacer by the Brits, or Operation Provide Comfort led by the US in Northern Iraq in 1991, where national leader saw what was happening and quickly intervened with enough force stop any further kill. Conversely, the leaders who were considering initiating mass atrocity operations to intervene in them will realize that time is not on their side. Those who are committing mass atrocities, mass killings, and genocide will also realize that time is not on their side. So the closer you get to initiating the intervention, the more likely they are to accelerate the faster. Thus, while preventive and preemptive may be in benign, less contested environments, the reactive forces are deploying into a non-permissive, hostile operating environment into the middle of a murderous maelstrom. Well, I figure that I've gone long enough to take too much of the time. Okay, but I, I thought I would try to bring you at least as many answers as questions. If I failed at that, I'm glad you got the questions. I'm sorry, I didn't bring more answers. It's easy to deliberate definitions here. It's harder to do it in the human and other halls of power. It's even harder to do it in the mud, in the mud, the dust, and the flies of far off outfits. But if we go back to E.O. Wilson, we want to distinguish ourselves from the ants, that we must carefully define these actions and then employ policies that will deploy effective forces. The words that make sense in a diplomatic press conference or a PowerPoint briefing slide may be of very little use to the 28-year-old company commander who has to employ force to achieve those objectives. Absent precision in words, it is impossible to expect precision.